and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Alan Mygett Tauber, Adjunct Professor at Virginia Commonwealth University and Assistant Counsel at the Naval Facilities Engineering Command. We will discuss his article, Rethinking the Reasoning of Verdugo Urquidez, which will be published in the Indiana Journal of Law and Social Equality. So welcome to the show, Alan. Uh, thank you, Brian. And I just have to start off by saying that while I do work for the United States Navy, nothing I say today represents the views of the United States Navy or the federal government. <laughs> of course not. Um, so Alan, uh, I really found this article fascinating because it goes to this sort of some of these you know questions about how we should think about the the Constitution uh, in an extraterritorial context and the Fourth Amendment specifically. But for listeners who might not be so familiar with this admittedly somewhat esoteric question, which is nonetheless you know pretty. Um, pretty timely right now. Uh, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the sort of broader context of sort of thinking about the Fourth Amendment uh, in an extraterritorial context uh, and how the Fourth Amendment applies to extraterritorial searches currently, if at all, in relation to sort of Supreme Court precedent. Yeah, so absolutely. Uh, the fact is the Supreme Court actually has really only looked at this question the one time in Verdugo or Quidez. Uh Lower courts uh, have to deal with this question a lot more frequently. So one of the key questions at the start of this whole endeavor is, does the Constitution apply outside of the United States at all? That's what extraterritoriality means. And there's a, a vigorous and ongoing debate about this question. Our criminal law extends extraterritorially quite regularly. We are regularly interdicting drug shipments on the high seas. Uh, we, the SEC attempts to enforce aspects of the Security Act for trades that occur overseas. And so the question that we have to ask is, if the criminal enforcement powers of the United States are going to apply overseas, then should the criminal procedural protections travel with them? And traditionally there, we are only talking about the Fourth Amendment. Uh, with one or two very rare exceptions, criminal trials don't take place outside the United States. So there's no question of confrontation clause. There's no question of jury trial, although the Supreme Court has addressed those issues in the past, uh, particularly the question of a jury trial in the uh, 1960s case called uh, Reed versus Covert, which dealt with uh, court martials of the wives of servicemen who had been accused of murdering their husbands. And in, in that case, a plurality of the Supreme Court would have extended the entire Bill of Rights overseas and said that wherever the United States extends the sword of federal power, it has to extend the shield of the Bill of Rights with it. Uh, that the proposition only got four justices in a majority, two others concurred on much narrower, narrower grounds. Uh, so the real question today, though, is the Fourth Amendment. And here, the, the one time the Supreme Court addressed the issue was in United States versus Verdugo or Quidez, which, again, was uh, the DEA investigating uh, a drug kingpin, someone who was also allegedly involved with the murder of a DEA agent uh, for which he was subsequently convicted, along with a couple other uh, Mexican nationals who also brought their cases to the Supreme Court uh, on related issues. So the question became, what restrictions, if any, were U.S. DEA agents under in conducting a search of Mr. Verdugo Urquidez's homes, which were located in Mexico? Here, what the Supreme Court determined was that the warrant requirement of the Fourth Amendment would not apply to searches that took place overseas of a non-citizen's home, provided that citizen lacked uh, what were known as substantial or significant connections with the United States. And in this case, the court determined that uh, being held in a San Diego jail for a few days didn't qualify as the sort of substantial connection. Neither apparently did importing tons of marijuana illegally in the United States. And so that's really the, the one time the court has addressed that specific question uh, at, at the Supreme Court level. Well, so in the paper, you suggest that kind of from a holistic standpoint, 
that there might be a tension between the reasoning of Verdugo or Quidez and another Supreme Court case, uh, Boumediene. I-, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and sort of why you think that tension exists and what, if anything, you think it tells us about the sort of substance of the reasoning of Verdugo or Quidez. Yeah, so one key part of Chief Justice Rehnquist's opinion in Verdugo or Quidez was this idea that the Fourth Amendment applied to the people. You know, the Fourth Amendment states that the rights of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects shall not be infringed, and no warrants shall issue but upon a showing of probable cause, etc. So here Rehnquist asked, well, what does the people mean? And, and he said, well, the people are a group of, of citizens and those aliens who have formed these substantial voluntary connections with the United States such that their rights should be respected. Now, in Boumediene, the Supreme Court held these alleged enemy combatants were entitled to the protection of the suspension clause under Article I, Section 9 of the Constitution, and that Congress could not take away their rights to a writ of habeas corpus, despite the fact that their only connection to the United States was being held within U.S. military custody on a military base in a foreign country. Now, in fairness, the court did hold that because of the lease of uh, between Cuba and the United States, which had been uh, extracted in 1903 upon the Cubans' return to sovereignty following the Spanish-American War, the United States exercised complete jurisdiction and control over Guantanamo Bay. And so there the court was arguing that Guantanamo Bay looked enough like United States sovereign territory that it would not be in the court's words, impracticable or anomalous to extend the writ of habeas corpus there. My argument is, you know, this reasoning really undercuts this idea that the Constitution only applies to the people, as argued by Justice by Chief Justice Rehnquist. Well, so returning to Verdigo Urquidez, you're pretty you're 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 pretty critical in your article of the reasoning uh, and practicality of Verdigo or Quidez. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about why. I mean, why is it, do you think, that lower courts have found it hard to sort of consistently and coherently apply Verdugo or Quidez? And are there aspects of the rationale of the case that you find particularly uncompelling or unworkable? Yeah. So the biggest issue is Chief Justice Rehnquist lays out this test that it gets called, as I mentioned earlier, alternatively significant connections or substantial connections. Uh, They go back and forth with whether or not you have to have these connections must be voluntary. There's some discussion as to whether or not presence is required. And of course, if we're talking about an extraterritorial search, uh, or seizure, typically th- that would mean that the person would be outside the United States. So how can you be both present in the United States, but also not? Uh, in this case, it was possible because he was present in a U.S. jail while his home in Mexico was being searched. But the biggest problem was, is the chief made zero effort to outline what is a connection, what it makes it substantial, how many did you have to have, how enduring do they have to be, And so really, lower courts have just been left in the wind with uh, this idea of, okay, we know you have to have substantial connections, but we're not going to give you any guideposts as to what those are. All we know for sure is that being held in uh, U.S. custody for three or four days doesn't meet those that, that standard. But there's absolutely no basis for determining what would. And that's where I've seen, as the paper argues, you look at these lower court decisions over the last 30 years since the court decided the issue, and courts are all over the place. In some jurisdictions, hey, you go to a U.S. college, good enough for a substantial connection. Uh, elsewhere, you got a family here, you got a wife, a kid, you've lived here for 10 years. Well, that, you've established familial connections to the United States, but not substantial voluntary connections for Fourth Amendment purposes. And so, you know, how is a police officer supposed to know if they need a warrant? How is a defense attorney supposed to know if they should file a motion to suppress if their client has Fourth Amendment rights? There's just absolutely nothing in the way of guidance from the Supreme Court opinion. Uh, An issue that Justice Brennan brought up in his dissent and which the majority just does not respond to. Mm. Well, what do you think of Rehnquist's reliance on the term 
the people as the basis for this kind of substantiality requirement? And has it come in to criticism? I mean, have people pointed to other ways of conceptualizing the scope of Fourth Amendment protection in this context? Yeah. So I guess the, I have a couple of problems with relying on this idea of the people. First of all, it doesn't apply to the warrant clause. The warrant clause is a second clause within the amendment. The the the, the, the people refers to who has the rights uh, to be secure in their person's houses, papers, and effects. But that's not what the Supreme Court held. What they said was, oh, you can't get a warrant in uh, Mexico. Not that there was no right at all. They just determined that a warrant was not required. Uh, secondly, you know, Chief, as, as I mentioned, Justice Brennan uh, wrote a dissent. He makes the argument that the term "the people" is more of a rhetorical flourish to uh, contrast with the government, and I, I think that is a somewhat compelling argument. Uh, the decision in Verdugo Riquidez was actually criticized almost immediately by other scholars uh, who study the Fourth Amendment after it was decided, and a lot of people have provided counter arguments. Uh, in in uh, his concurrence in the case, Justice Stevens argued that the reasonableness requirement of the Fourth Amendment should still apply. He just would have found this search reasonable. Justice Blackman dissented. Uh, he, he also agreed that reasonableness would apply, but he would have remanded the case down to lower courts to determine whether or not in the first instance the search was reasonable. <clears throat> uh, lower courts had prior to Verdugo Urquidez, <clears throat> Urquidez when dealing with searches of Americans abroad, fallen back on this standard uh, called a, the joint venture test. And what they asked was, did the United States agents act in concert with local law enforcement officials? And if they did, which was the case in Verdugo Riquidez, uh, then they determined whether or not the search complied with local law. And if those searches complied with local law, so if a search occurred in Great Britain, for example, did it comply with UK standards of searches and seizures? If it did, then, hey, you're in the clear. If not, then we're going to exclude that evidence as far as US citizens are concerned. Uh, again, Justice Brennan took probably the strongest view, sort of taking the same view Justice Black did in the Reed versus Covert plurality opinion and said, hey, anytime the United States law enforcement acts abroad, the Fourth Amendment is the uh, unavoidable correlative, I believe is what he called it, of their actions. So in other words, you want to conduct a search or seizure abroad, it's no different than conducting a search or seizure within the United States. You go to a neutral magistrate, you present your probable cause affidavits, and you get yourself a warrant. Mm, mm. Well, so it seems like one of the many problems with Verdugo or Quides is that some of its reasoning seems to sort of seep into the analysis of other constitutional clauses. Is that a sort of an accurate assessment? And if so, sort of what evidence do we have to point to that happening? Yeah, that, that, that is in fact the case. As, as I argue in the article, in the wake of Verdugo Riquidez, lower courts have kind of just treated it as the test for determining whether any uh, amendment applies overseas, even if it doesn't use the, the, the phrase the people in it. And you know, while I criticize Justice Rank, Chief Justice Rehnquist's textual exegesis, uh, there is no doubt that his decision – did rely heavily on the uh, inclusion of the phrase the people in there. And so seeing lower courts add uh, other amendments like the Fifth Amendment's due process clause or the takings clause and saying, oh, you have to have sufficient connections or substantial connections to the United States between uh, – or sorry – you have to have sufficient connections or significant connections to the United States before you can say, hey, the federal government expropriated my property in uh, Azerbaijan or somewhere else. Before I can say, hey, you owe me just compensation, that just doesn't make any sense. Mm. And so, yeah, lower courts ha have applied it to a variety of uh, amendments that do not have any mention of the people in them at all. And, and, and it's just caused, again, further confusion. It also creates a conflict with another line of Supreme Court cases, which deal with personal jurisdiction over foreign corporations at the state level. 
uh, the, the Supreme Court has issued five or six cases saying that, hey, uh, before you before a state's long arm statute can haul a foreign corporation before state courts to face a uh, tort claim or other sort of damages claim, you have to have minimum contacts with the jurisdiction. So in that case, where it is your lack of contact with the United States, which is what causes you to gain protection of the 14th Amendment's due process clause. But meanwhile, we've had other courts say that because you lack uh, substantial connection with the United States, you're not entitled to the Fifth Amendment's due process clause. And so we've seen that in the Court of Armed, uh, the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, where they ruled that uh, wearing the uniform of the United States was not enough. Uh, the Southern District of New York has held that the uh, due process clause of the Fifth Amendment does not apply to a uh, an alien without substantial connections, as had the Fourth Circuit. The Court of Federal Claims in the Southern District of Florida have held that the takings clause doesn't apply unless you have substantial connections to the United States. And that actually flies in the face of an early Supreme Court case called the Russian Volunteer Fleet, where a corporation's only connection to the United States was that it was having a couple of ships built here, which were seized by the government for use uh, in, I believe it was World War I. And they were entitled to Fifth Amendment protections. Yet we have these lower court cases a hundred years later saying no. And and again, the Fifth Amendment applies to persons or in the case of the takings clause to anyone whose property is being taken for public use. It does not draw a distinction in the way that arguably the Fourth Amendment might. Well, so in your paper, you propose a couple different alternative approaches that courts might take to specifically the Fourth Amendment extraterritoriality question. I wonder if you could start by talking a little bit about what you think lower courts can do more or less on their own to sort of better rationalize and make coherent the doctrine in this area and provide the kind of predictability and consistency that we would want in this kind of context. Yeah, well, so the easiest thing that lower courts could do, and this would not require stretching at all, is just to apply the substantial connections test in a, a principled way. Just start coming up with a set of guideposts, and I, I suggest a few that they could do to look at to start to determine, hey, what does a substantial connection make? Or, or rather, what makes a substantial connection? You know, even in these cases where they're struggling with this and these courts are dividing all over the place, nobody has taken the lead and said, well, hey, this is the type of connection that we consider substantial versus this is a connection that would be ephemeral. They just look at it on a very case-by-case, fact-specific basis, and, and no lower court judge has taken it upon themselves to say, well, I'm going to try to produce a framework. And that is something they could do. They, you know, I, I suggest, for example, if you have a child in the United States who's a United States citizen, or if you're married to a United States citizen, Familial ties tend to be pretty substantial, you know. I, I, it certainly should create a rebuttable presumption of a uh, substantial connection to the United States. Now, sure, you come to the United States, you, you, you father give birth to a child, and then you leave, and you never have anything to do with the United States again. I think there's a pretty good argument you don't have a substantial connection. But if you're living here or if you're regularly visiting family here – uh, this is the sort of thing that, that seems to me pretty substantial. You know, as a father myself, I feel I have a very substantial connection with my son. I would be quite shocked if somebody said, well, just having a kid, that, that's not a substantial connection. It's, you know, ties of blood tend to be as substantial as they get. You know, I would probably in this, uh, as I argue in the paper, on, under this framework, would probably find that uh, – Going to a university in the United States by itself probably doesn't create a substantial connection. And, and here I analogize the fact that, you know, every state has in-state and out-of-state tuition for their state universities. No state that I'm aware of allows you to count uh, time going to school towards residency. So, you, you know, they, they, they sort of fix it so that, hey, I don't just pay out-of-state tuition that first year and then get in-state tuition every other year because we have determined that merely going to school in a state is not enough of a connection to grant you that sort of residency that would get you the privileges of in-state tuition. And so by the same factor, I would say, hey, you're just coming to the United States, getting your undergraduate or graduate degree and leaving after two to four to six years – 
that's probably not a substantial connection such that if later you turned out to be involved in a criminal enterprise and we went to search your property back in your home country, you probably wouldn't be able to claim the Fourth Amendment. And so this is the sort of thing that lower courts can do. They could also uh, take another step right now and say, hey, look, we're going to look at the most recent uh, explication of the extraterritorial of the, comp of the Constitution in Boumedien. And we're not going to look at Verdugo or Cadiz anymore. We're going to say that's been subsumed. Uh, Justice Kennedy joined the majority in uh, Verdugo Riquidez, and then he wrote a separate concurrence, which he states doesn't really depart that much from the rationale, but then uh, does away with the uh, reliance on the phrase the people, and instead he focuses on this impracticable or anomalous test that first appeared in the Reed versus Covert concurrence. Uh, Boumediene takes that impracticable and anomalous test and constitutionalizes it by, for the first time, giving it a five justice majority, where that was the the argument they made was that it was not impracticable or anomalous to apply the suspension clause to Guantanamo Bay. It would be perfectly valid for lower courts to say, absent further guidance from the Supreme Court, we're going to ask whether or not applying the Fourth Amendment uh, would be impracticable and anomalous in uh, various cases. There, Justice Kennedy laid out some practical concerns to applying the warrant requirement. Uh, some of them I don't think necessarily always apply. Uh, and, but that's something that the courts could look at because that's one of the things you look at it when, when conducting an analysis under the impractical anomalous test or what are the practical obstacles to uh, enforcing the right as argued. And so these are the sorts of things that lower courts could address themselves. Uh, I think a better way to go personally is to uh, shift the focus rather on who is being searched to who is doing the searching. But in that case, uh, that lower courts would probably have to wait for guidance from the Supreme Court on that, given the existence of Verdugo or Quides. Right. So following up on that, you propose a somewhat more ambitious, uh, entirely alternative framework for thinking about extraterritorial Fourth Amendment uh, interpretation. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, how it would work, and why you think it would be superior to the framework that we're currently using. Yeah, absolutely. So basically, my view is that we should do a modified version of the uh, of the test that lower courts used prior to and since Verdugo is with the substantial participation. So the first question that court should ask is, is, are U.S. law enforcement officers conducting the search for law enforcement purposes? If the answer is yes, then the Fourth Amendment should apply. It's simple. It provides a bright line. It's uh, not a case by, I mean, there would still be some case by case analysis, perhaps at the edges, but if the United States agents either conduct the search themselves or are substantially involved and participate in the search, then the Fourth Amendment applies. Uh, I think it's uh, a better test for a variety of reasons. I know one of Justice Kennedy's concerns was that the Constitution should not be read to apply to some undefined, limitless class of people encompassing every citizen in the world. Well, I argue that it's a very well-defined and delimited population. U.S. law enforcement agents engaged in enforcing criminal laws outside our borders. We know who those people are. We tell them to go do it. That would not be an extension of current law uh, because you know it, would, it wouldn't stretch it very far already, alien or not. The Fourth Amendment applies to you almost uh, entirely when you're in the United States. So it's just extending it outside. Uh, I prefer to look only to U.S. law as opposed to foreign law because sometimes it can be hard to determine what foreign law is. That was one of Justice Kennedy's practical concerns was that, oh, we can't ascertain what notions of privacy are to be expected in countries outside the United States. Well, you know what? I'm not asking the DEA to figure out what Mexican or Venezuelan or British or Spanish expectations of privacy are. You know what the expectations of privacy in the United States are. It's when you practice, you know, you get warrants on a regular basis for searching in the United States. It also provides uh, easy guidance to courts for what to do with aliens that have substantial connections. See, that, that's another flaw in the Verdugo-Urquidez reasoning. Uh, because they determined 
that Verdugo Riquidez himself did not have substantial connections, they stopped. They said, oh, no substantial connections, no warrant required, moving on. They provided lower courts with no guidance what, uh, as to what to do if they determined that uh, a, an alien does have substantial connections uh, and is searched or seized outside the United States. So in that case, what the courts have done is they've been applying the uh, this this uh, joint venture test. And so basically what I'm doing is just cutting out step one and just saying, let's just start at the joint venture test, but with a slight modification in that we only focus on U.S. law and whether or not the search or seizure would be reasonable here. Well, so Alan, I'm not, it struck me reading your paper, and this is a really interesting take on kind of thinking about the Fourth Amendment in a particular context, but it, it seems to me like it almost reflects a certain rethinking of the Fourth Amendment in a broader sense, in the sense that there's like in at least your proposal, there's kind of a reframing of the core question from the subjectivity of the connection between the searched and the and the location, and more of kind of an objective question about what is the government doing and are the government's actions justified under the circumstances. Is that a is that a, a fair reading of what? you're saying and i just wonder what you think that me that would like encourage us to think about the fourth amendment more broadly if if anything yeah yeah i would say that is a, a fair reading of what i'm arguing for you know right now uh, when we when we think of the fourth amendment typically we conceptualize it as an individual right held by a person who says hey the government came and overstepped their bounds and took my right and I am entitled to protections on that basis. And really, I think uh, the better way that I've argued in this paper to look at it is, is no, the Fourth Amendment is not a grant of a right to the individual. It is instead a further restriction on government power. You know, we, we're taught from you know eighth grade civics onward that the founders set up a government of limited powers. Madison and, and the Federalists argued that a Bill of Rights was not even necessary because the only powers that the, the federal government was supposed to have were those laid out in Articles 1, 2, and 3 of the Constitution, in the case of Congress and Article 1 and Section 8. So uh, I, the argument I make is that, yeah, the, the Anti-Federalists didn't trust that. So they said, hey, no, before we sign on to this thing, we want a Bill of Rights. But what the Bill of Rights was doing was not uh, – adding things that we didn't already – would not otherwise have. It was just clarifying and carving out and saying, by the way, those powers of Congress we lay out in Article One, Section 8 do not include these things. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the history of the Fourth Amendment, Madison had uh, proposed originally interpolating it and adding it to, sec to Article One, Section 9, which is restrictions – on the power of Congress. That's where Congress is told you can't pass ex post facto laws, you can't do bills of attainder, and you can only suspend the writ of habeas corpus in times of insurrection or, or, or rebellion. So if that is where, in fact, the Fourth Amendment was meant to be, then, then that is the proper reading of it. It is a restriction on Congress and says, hey, you cannot authorize general searches. You cannot violate the sanctity that people have already without getting a warrant you know and if you read some of the work by Akhil Lamar on the first uh, the, the original intention of the fourth amendment you know the, the the appropriate way to deal with fourth amendment violations was an action in, in trespass against the officer who, who conducted the search or seizure the warrant was the officer's get out of civil liability card so that's what the the intention, I think, was, and I'm arguing by if we return to that kind of that more original understanding, then it seems to me no question the Fourth Amendment would apply to the agent regardless of who they are searching or seizing or where that search or seizure takes place. Awesome. Well, so Alan, in closing, uh, I note that you've been publishing quite a bit lately, and you've been pursuing an unusual method of placing your articles for publication. I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and your experiences doing that, 
and uh, you know, kind of any thoughts you might have on the submission process, especially for people like yourself who aren't necessarily in sort of traditional tenure track academic jobs. Yeah, I, I've been pursuing what I call the Brian L. Fry method of uh, law review publication and placement. Uh, the, the freedom of not being uh, an academic on the tenure track is that I don't have to pay as much attention perhaps to U.S. News and World Report rankings and where I get the article published. You know, my concern is to get the idea out there so that it's seen by practitioners and judges and even other academics who maybe want to engage at this level. But, you know, I know that there is a drive. I, I was in a uh, I have my master's degree in political science. I, I have my JD. I have been in the academic world, and I know there is a drive for prestigious publications. It's not enough to get published for a lot of people. It's, oh, you got a place in a top three journal. You got a place in a Harvard, a Yale, a Stanford, an NYU, a Chicago, a T14, and, 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 you know, and it's not enough to get a journal at that school, it's got to be the flagship journal at that school. And so there's this lot of pressure. And I mean, you know, I've been reading lately on Twitter, some of these journals getting 1400 plus, you know, expedite requests. That's not even just initial uh, offers of, hey, I'd, I'd like you to look at my article. It's, it's hey, I've, I've got an offer from somebody further down the chain. I'd like you to look more quickly at my article for placement in your more prestigious journal. You know, and as somebody who who was on a journal at a, a school, you know, not in the T14, it, it's it's kind of uh, you know insulting to be like, oh, you're just using me as the stepping stone to the next <laughs> highest uh, placement. You know, it's like, oh yeah, you you, you apply to to hundred journals. When you get an offer from ninety to a hundred, you go up to the next ninety and say, oh, I've got an offer, and see if you can get an offer from seventy, and then use that to work your way up to an offer to somebody in the top fifty. Uh, I found it much more easier to just post the article on SSRN and say on Twitter, hey, here's the latest draft of my, my – your most recent draft of my article. Who wants it? First come, first serve. And uh, thanks to help from folks like you who have uh, who've amplified that call, I've, I've had journals reach out to me and say, hey, we'd like to – to uh, publish your work. It's great. It saves me time. It saves me effort and it saves money because so many journals like, oh, we only work with Scholastica, which 650 a pop for uh, for getting your article uh, even submitted for m most likely a chance at rejection. Uh, you know, if, if your school's willing to pay for that, that's one thing. When you're funding it out of your own pocket, that's that's a whole different animal. And so, yeah, no, it's it's been great. And especially, you know, these days where, you know, most people are doing their research via Lexis or Westlaw. Well, Lexis and Westlaw don't care about prestige. They're doing language searches, either natural language or Boolean, and pulling up the most relevant results regardless of the, the, the rank or the perceived quality of the journal. And so – as long as the you know the article is out there, it, it in a journal that that is covered by Lexis or and Westlaw, it's going to get picked up. It's going to get found by practitioners. It's going to get found by judges, and it's going to get found by academics. And you know, and and therefore the ideas are going to spread. And that has for me been a really great. Uh, you know, I also not to worry about submission windows. Oh, got to get this done by February. Got to get this done by August. It's done when it's done. It goes out when it goes out. And it, it ends up where, you know, the, the people who are Johnny on the spot and say, hey, I, I want that article. Great. It's yours. Awesome. Thanks for, so much for coming on the show, Alan. Oh, thanks for having me. Mm -hmm.